The scripture reading this morning is from the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. This was a letter written while Paul was captive in Rome around the year 62 or 63, and it was written to the churches. It was written, appears to have been written as a kind of um, circulating letter to the churches in Asia who Paul had spent time with just five years or so previous. He was in Ephesus for three years and apparently the power of the gospel was so strong that people from the synagogues sent emissaries to Ephesus to hear the gospel that Paul had to share and they went out then and established churches in the major population centers in what is now Turkey but in those days it was a, a thriving province of the Roman Empire so probably those included the seven letters that are mentioned in the opening chapters of the Revelation. But uh, you know, he's, this is essentially this and the letter to the Colossians, which seems to have gone out at the same time, is essentially a message to young Christians about what their commitment to Christ entails, both the blessings and then God's vision for them as a people. So it's a, it's a really powerful summary of the Christian faith, and I, I have to tell you that in a Bible study, even though there are six chapters in the book, in a Bible study that I was in uh, a few years ago, we took 18 months to go through it. It's that deep. But this is the first chapter, and it's, it's pretty powerful. After Paul's introduction in the first two verses, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to ado for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In Greek, this whole section is one long uh, run-on sentence, you know, so it's amazing that they're able to break it up in the way that they do, the translators do. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we who were Jews were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also, you who are Gentiles, were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all his people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that can be invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The word of the Lord, la palabra del Señor, Thanks be to God. Gracias a Dios. Amen. Amen. Well, again, uh, Jessica, I hope everybody here had a, a good Thanksgiving. 
But as we know from our uh, prayer requests and things that, that came down this last week, that for some people, holidays aren't always a happy time. There are difficult things. Death and, and illness don't take a holiday. So we had prayers for, so we know that there are folks that, that um, struggle with the loss of, of loved ones this week or um, feeling that sorrow or people very, very seriously ill. But this morning, this morning, this scripture passage here is just all filled with good news. It's just all happy stuff. And, and so I hope that there's somebody here this morning who really needs to hear some good news and wants to hear the, um, a good word from the, from the Lord today. Because as, as Darwin said, you could spend a long, long time in here. There's so much good stuff in here that it can be very difficult to know how to focus. You know, what are we going to focus on today? But as I mentioned earlier, today is Christ the King Sunday, and so we're focusing on Jesus and on the reign of Christ, and we can say, you know, God is in charge of the world. Jesus is in charge as he is the king of, of everything. That's the best news of all for us today, because then we have no worries. All those things that we fuss about and worry about, if you're concerned about the state of, of the nation or the state of the state or or even our own selves, things that are going on in our own lives, take heart today because Christ is in control. God is, is the king and in charge, and so we can rest in that and feel confident in that. Well, this passage here, though, it does speak of Christ as the head of the church and, and the one who's been exalted to the right hand of the Father, but it's a very Trinitarian passage um, there's a lot of a good picture in here about the Father. It speaks a, a lot about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so this passage can help us to know God better is, as our triune God. But today we're also going to see this passage shows us a lot also about who we are in Christ. And so this helps us to understand our own identity in Christ because sometimes, a lot of times that gets lost we, we too easily um, believe falsehoods about ourselves. We get told things, and we can take that to heart. I have a, a book uh, from called Identity Crisis by Tamara Buchan, who was, uh, she is a covenant pastor, and she had written this book of, about five years ago about issues that she was seeing in, in her church that, that we seem to have a lot of struggle remembering who we are in Christ. And so she writes in here, she says, we're in an identity crisis because we've been duped, lied to, stolen from, and in many ways destroyed. The thief, the joy robber of life has come and tempted us into a series of agreements with the continual messages whispering to us we are small and our lives don't matter. He wants us to accept the ultimate lie we are not enough. And that's a lie. I think too often we do receive those things and believe that thing. Has anybody in here ever been told that you're not good enough? That you're not whatever. You're not rich enough. You're not tall enough. You're not able. You don't have the right gifts. You don't have the skills or, or whatever. That your life doesn't matter. You're just... You know, I mean, I, this book, I think, was written before the Black Lives Matter movement. But all of this, we can all feel that sense of, of being small, being not worthy enough, not having the right things that we, that we need, not as good as somebody else. And this isn't just a problem, I think, for, for us as individuals, but I think sometimes as a church, don't we often accept those lies about ourselves as well? We're too small. We're... We don't matter. We don't make a difference in, in our community or whatever. We, we are not good enough. Do we receive that lie into ourselves? Well, this morning, whenever we're confronted with lies from Satan, we need to go to God's word and find out, but what's the truth? What does God really say? And so God, as he spoke through the Apostle Paul, Paul, uh, Paul writing this letter under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, no, he says, he chose, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for he, the Father, chose us in him before the creation of the world. We were chosen. 
We've been chosen by God before the creation of the world. God had you in mind, had us in mind before he ever even began. And he chose us to be holy and blameless. That's the, the purpose of his selection here is to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, we don't always get that right, whether as a church or as individuals. We um, don't always walk in that holiness and blamelessness. But we have to remember that this is our calling. This is what God has chosen us for so that we can be God's ambassadors to the world and share Christ with the world so others will see how God intended people to live. We've got, it's a high calling, and it's a challenge for us. But if we remember, you know, we've been chosen by God for this purpose. He has a plan for you and for your life and for this church. From the very beginning, he has a plan, and he will see that worked out. We have been redeemed. He said, because in love, in love, God loved us so much. He said he predestined us for adoption. We've been redeemed by the spirit, by the blood of Jesus and adopted then into sonship. Now, ladies, we don't want to get offended by the masculine language here of sonship. We have to remember that in those days that you know, daughters often were not able to inherit they were not allowed to inherit in most cases. And so it were the sons. You know, if, you, if a man had five daughters but only one son, well, that son was the one who would inherit everything. Um, so the word here is that we, all of us, have been adopted into sonship, meaning that we are heirs. We have that inheritance that is waiting for us. And so who are you in Christ this morning? You are one who has been chosen. You are one who has been redeemed and you have been adopted into God's family. Into God's family. We are sons and daughters. We are children of the king and heirs of the promises that we will receive all of this that God has planned for us. So adoption, you know, those the children that are adopted, they ha have all the same legal rights as biological children. And so we have that gift we have the inheritance all that god has in store for us is ours and further we know then we are included in this because the the what the father is after is is unity he speaks here of this mystery he made known to us paul says mo made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure he said which is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And a little later in, in chapter 3, Paul talks a little more about that mystery that's been revealed. He says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Jesus Christ. And so, again, this this idea of being included that you're not left out because you're of your race or your gender or your socioeconomic standing nothing that leaves us out because the invitation the promise is for all and so he says in him we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first and I'm glad that Darwin added those words, you know, reminded that as the Jews were the first to trust in Christ, they were the ones who believed first and heard the message of the gospel, came to Christ and put their faith in Christ. But he says, then the Gentiles also, this word was expanded and taken forth to them. He said, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And then it says, and when you believed, because that's the key, of course, we put our trust in Christ. We have to believe in the Lord in order to receive the gift that has been given to us. It says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And so we received the gift of the Holy Spirit as soon as we believe. No difference. We're all included as we come to Christ we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit and marked with him. It says here that this is 
a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So this is a, a down payment. It's just a small taste. All of these good things that we've experienced because of God's calling us, his being chosen, being redeemed, being adopted into the family, being included, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, all of these wonderful things are just a small taste. I mean, Paul's prayer here is he, said he wants people to have the Spirit. He said, so that, so that we can know God better, so that we can have that hope of our calling. We talked a lot about that last week, about the hope that we have, a hope that this world badly needs right now. Um, and we can understand and feel, experience the power of the Holy Spirit. These are the things that we experience right here today and understand, you know, the Holy Spirit that helps us to know God more, to understand Christ and to walk in his ways. It gives us the ability to do that, to understand our calling, to have hope of our eternal life with Christ and to have the power to be able to live and to work out God's will in our lives, to have that power. All of this, he says, is just what we have right now is a small taste of what it's going to be. A down payment, like, a, like that, uh, that earnest money that you put down to show, yes, I'm really intending to buy this house, or the small little bit to say, yes, it's going to be there. God has given to us a deposit to guarantee our inheritance that we are going to experience down the road. And, and Paul wrote in, in Corinthians, did I have that? I did have. Um, about, you know, how eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has come into the mind of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. You know, we cannot even imagine what it's going to be because if we have this small amount right now, and I know we still struggle and we, we face our trials and, and it's not always easy, but we've got that power, we've got that gift from the Holy Spirit to hold us firm, to carry us through, to we have that promise. We know that we're going to be with Christ for all of eternity. And so we hold firm to that. So when that voice comes to you, whether it's an external voice or even just a voice in your own head saying, you are not good enough, you are not enough, or you are not whatever, rebuke that voice in the name of Jesus because remind him of what God says. No, I am chosen. I am redeemed, I am adopted as a son into the family of Christ. I am included, and I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Remember that, and hold firm to that. Remind yourself daily, if that's what you have to do. Say, this is who I am in Christ. I am a child of the Most High God. And then can we learn and pray, even as Paul prays. I mean, we... We pray for one another in a variety of ways. We often pray for our uh, physical well-being, which nothing wrong with that because God loves every aspect of our being. He, he invites us, wants us to bring every need to the Lord. And so we pray for one another for anything large and small. But let's remember and pray for ourselves, for, for one another, for the folks that don't know Christ, for this church, the things that that Paul asked for, you know, that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know God better, that our eyes would be enlightened in order to know the hope to which God has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people, his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's pray these things over one another as well. Pray for more of the Holy Spirit for each one of us and for this church. If we're going to be the church that God calls us to be, we need his power and we need that fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit every single week when we gather together. And so let's pray as Paul has prayed here um, for one another. Remember that Christ is the head. Christ is the Lord. And so we do not have to be in charge. We don't have to worry. He's got it under control. So would you pray with me this morning? So Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us. 
to be your own children. Father, help us never, ever to take that for granted. And help us not to listen to those voices that would try and put us down. Even sometimes when that voice is our own. Help us to live into this identity that you have called us to, to be children of the Most High God. And Lord, help us to share that word with others so that don't understand that just yet, who haven't come to you by faith and who haven't experienced that power. We would pray this morning for our loved ones that they also would be adopted into your family. Remind us, Lord, daily to pray for all of those we love and those maybe who are our enemies even. And so we can pray. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen.